Hi there, welcome to the Disability Law Show. I am John Scholes, he is Savan Tamarka. We talk about disability rights and injury law on the show if you uh, want to catch up anytime. And reach out and contact 1-855-821-5900 uh, is a good way to start. There is also the uh, contact of help at disabilityrights.ca or simply disabilityrights.ca online. Lots of great stuff on the show today. We'll get to some of your emails and talk about a bunch of good things that are uh, really of importance to people in their daily lives because a lot of people on disability, a lot of people are facing injury law and uh, dealing with insurance companies today so we'll get to that and as well the top five mistakes individuals make when dealing with long-term disability insurers that is of course right in your wheelhouse but uh, the week that was success story what do you got going on Phil? okay John I have an interesting one yep. I had a uh, 32 year old gentleman contact me uh, this was two weeks ago and he's a factory worker uh, worked for you know ever since he finished grade 10 uh, at, at a factory uh, a small town uh, rural Ontario and, uh, you know, he injured his back, uh, not at work, outside of work. He was playing hockey, actually, uh, but it was, it was, it's a pretty bad injury. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's been on long-term disability now for almost two years. And he's contacted a few weeks ago by his adjuster, the claims manager, telling him, you're coming up to the two-year mark, your LTD expires. Okay. And... A lot of people get that. A lot of people are told, you're coming up to the two-year mark, your long-term disability will end. Right. And so people think, I only have long-term disability for two years with my insurance company. No, absolutely not. The reality is that the vast majority of policies out there, long-term disability policies, will contain uh, a provision in your policy that says that to qualify for long-term disability for the first two years, you have to demonstrate medically that you cannot do your own occupation. Beyond the two-year mark, to cross that threshold, the test changes, it expands. Now you have to demonstrate medically, with the support of your doctors, that you can't do any occupation for which you're suited for by training, education, or, or experience. experience. Yeah. Now this gentleman is fairly young, 32 years old, right? He's a young guy. So the question is, can he be trained to do anything else? Well, that's one question. But the issue in front of him is he doesn't really have that much training other than the job that he's been no. doing since, since grade 10, the end of grade 10. Uh, he doesn't know computers that well. He, he can't, you know, he's a worker, he's, he's a worker exactly. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But insurance companies will then use that against you. They will try to intimidate you. They will try to tell you, we're, you know, we're cutting you off benefits and you're going to have to do something else. And of course, the letter that he got says that he can appeal that decision. But when he called me, he called me because somebody in his family saw our show and said, you know, maybe your benefits should not be ending at that two year mark. Right. And that's why he called me. And you know, I've read the letters from his doctors. He has a fairly bad injury to his back. And because of that injury that he's been living with and all the physical therapy he's been doing, he's been getting progressively more and more depressed. And so now he also have, has a psychotherapist. So now there is an overlaying condition, a mental health issue that we're dealing with. No question in my mind that he should be getting uh, payments from the insurance company beyond the two-year mark. And so what we've done is we've, I, I wrote to the insurance company and we started a dialogue with them. They're not going to cut him off. We've averted that cutoff. Uh, and instead, we're discussing whether or not they're going to simply continue paying him or whether or not they're going to try to negotiate a lump sum settlement. Right. But the point is, the key here is, the policy doesn't expire at the two-year mark. And that's what most people think when they get that call or letter or email from the adjuster saying to them, uh, your benefits are ending at two, at two years. You should be able to do some other kind of work, some other kind of occupation. Maybe some people can, but some people can't. And if you know that you can't do any other occupation for which you're suited for or have training or experience, your benefits should not end at the two-year mark. As soon as you're told that they will be, you call us, you email us, let us tell you what your legal options are. And that way you'll be armed with that information. You can decide, just like this gentleman, what you want to do. Because, again, you have a lot more power against insurance companies than you think you do. You know, it's, it's weird that the language that the insurance company use, your policy will expire. Now, I guess not all policies are the same, but if, if one were to get open up that policy and dig down deep enough, would they not find that a lot of policies expire at the age of 65? Yeah. That's a long way from 32. Sure. 
right? Sure. You're absolutely right. You do have policies out there. There are two-year policies, five-year policies, but you also have policies that take you beyond age 65 as well. Wow. You have some of them that have a cost of living increase built into them. There are different policies. That's why we always want to take a look at the policy, at the very least a denial letter or email from the adjuster because the insurance company will usually quote the provision in the policy that they're relying on to, gotcha. to stop your, pay, your payments. But, you know, what's the message here? The message is don't take what your insurance company says at face value. If they're going to cut you off, if you reach 65 and your policy go, goes to age 65, we can't help you. Of course. That's what the policy says. Yep. But if you're 32, if you're 50, if you're 64, and they tell you your policy is expiring now, and you still are disabled, you give us a call you get, right. because we can help you. 1-855-821-5900 is the number. Or simply go to disabilityrights.ca for more information. You can also get information on our radio show as well, which we've been doing for years and years. we got a ton of phone calls on the show, and we play them back right here on the Disability Law Show. Uh, today's phone call is coming up right now. Got hurt in an accident, and my knee was damaged. I was working for a trucking company in about 12 years. My knee needed to be replaced. I'm still off work two and a half years collecting long-term disability from my employer, and my doctor has recently told me that I'm not going to be able to go back to that job because physically I won't be able to do it. So my long-term disability expires in March of next year, and then I'm left out to drive. And he says he doesn't have light-duty jobs here. If I can't physically do it, then he doesn't want me back. Where do we start? Expiration, employer issues. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, this is, again, one of the things people need to know is we have both employment lawyers and disability right. lawyers like myself, and we work in tandem. Why? Because employees are often stuck in the middle. In this case, with this gentleman, he says that the LTD is being paid by his employer. You do have some companies out there, employers, we see this with banks, we see this usually with larger type of, right. of companies, where they're the ones paying the long-term disability. They may have an insurance company making decisions or adjudicating the file, but they're the ones paying. Now this gentleman here, look, use the word expired. He thinks that yeah. his policy or his benefits should expire at a two-year mark. He's been on, on uh, 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 getting payments for about two and a half years, which means he probably got short-term disability at the beginning and now is about to approach the two-year two mark for LTD. Uh, and to boot, his employer is not accommodating him, nope. right? They, they, they really do, tried. Ah, you, I got nothing. You talk with Lior about that all the time, yeah. accommodation. It's a very onerous duty on employers. Yeah. So here you have an employer that's cutting him off LTD and tells him, we don't have any light duties for you. I don't think so. I don't think so. We can help this individual both on the employment side and the LTD front. And here's why it's absolutely crucial. If you're dealing with, uh, dealing with a long-term disability issue uh, to come to us, okay? This is a bit self-serving here, but I will tell you, not many firms have expertise in both areas. Mm -hmm. If you have a lawyer negotiate severance for you on the employment side, and that employment lawyer doesn't understand long-term disability, your long-term disability insurance company may get full credit for that severance you received. Right. So the lawyer got paid, uh, the insurance company got paid, you didn't get a dime, and you're stuck. So you want to make sure, again, that you go somewhere. It's not just us. There are other lawyers that deal with this as well, but we have a specific expertise in those two areas of law, employment and disability. So you want to make sure you go to someone that has that expertise because we can maximize how much money lends in your pocket. If there's any sort of uh, human rights breach in this as well, now those damages... Uh, 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 now you should be a lawyer. Ah, you know, well, I've done it in a is, while. No, you're absolutely right. This is what people need to understand. It is illegal to fire someone on disability. Right. It's against the human rights code. Right. Why is that relevant? Other than the fact that the employer then is on the hook for potential human rights damages above severance, right. Insurance companies can't get credit for human rights damages. So let's use a simple example. Right. Employee X gets terminated while on disability, uh, gets $30,000 in severance, no human rights damages, because the lawyer didn't think of that. Well, the insurance company gets full credit, potentially, for that $30,000. You see not a dime out of it, but yeah. you paid your lawyer. On the other hand, let's say we negotiated the severance such that it's $15,000 for the severance, and $15,000 for human rights damages. Mm -hmm. Now the insurance company can only touch $15,000 in severance, not the human rights damages right. which go in your pocket. You see how just one move here can me me mean the difference of, of thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars in people's pockets, people who now don't have a job. 
So it's absolutely crucial, again, to go to a law firm. This is what we do. They have specialty in employment and disability, so we understand the full system, both sides, and how they interact. Right. We'll take a uh, short break here. Top five mistakes individuals make when dealing with LTD insurers. That is coming up. You'll want to reach out, 1-855-821-5900 at disabilityrights.ca. Lots more of the Disability Law Show is on the way. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. You lost your job. They only gave you two weeks of severance per year worked. But where can you find out what you're really owed? I'm going to severancepaycalculator.com. Find out how much you're owed right now. Severancepaycalculator.com. You've been denied long-term disability. You think you're powerless, but you have a lot more power than you think. I'll tell you a secret. It's a numbers game for the insurance company. They're betting on you walking away from money that they owe you. Don't make that mistake. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. Call Savan and his team, 1-855-821-5900, or go to disabilityrights.ca. You lost your job. They said they had a good reason, but you think you've been wrongfully dismissed. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. And welcome back to the Disability Law Show, 1-855-821-5900 to reach out any time or uh, quite simply disabilityrights.ca is the website. You get more information on the radio show uh, there as well. As promised, we'll get into this. That is the top five mistakes individuals make when dealing with long-term disability. There's five today, uh, Savant, so I know you're locked and loaded to get into these. First one is this, assuming that the adjuster's first priority is you. Well, we know that's not the case, but people out there don't know that, uh, especially when you're dealing with an adjuster that is very friendly and nice. Yeah. And legitimately, that person can be just a nice person and a good person, but they have a job to do. And a boss. And a boss, yeah. and a manager, and a supervisor, yeah. and a VP of claims. You need to understand the way that the structure here of the insurance company, how it operates, and how their interests are not aligned with your interest. You know, when you buy a car, it's in the interest of the dealership to make sure you're happy, to make sure that you get the product that you're buying. Mm -hmm. When an insurance company sells you a product, like long-term disability, or to your employer, if they're the ones yep. paying the premiums, their interests are not aligned with you. They are telling you that they're selling you peace of mind so that if at some point in the future you can't work, they're going to pay those income replacement benefits to you, uh, they don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. They want to find every reason or excuse not to pay that. Uh, and so in that way, you have to understand the adjuster that's dealing with you does not have your best interests at heart, no matter how good of a person they are, no matter how friendly they are. So just understand that, which is why we're going to get to other things here, to other items. You have to make sure that you are always on your guard when you are dealing with them. You bet. Top five mistakes individuals make when dealing with long-term disability insurers. Number two, assuming that your insurer will take uh, what your doctor says at face value. They, they will not. And we've seen this time and time again, and I've had doctors call me uh, and write to me in frustration, not against me, but against the insurance company that's rejecting their patient's claims. And they're asking me for help to understand how it is that they can deal with the insurance company. Look, insurance companies, adjusters, they will cherry pick from the doctor's report. A doctor can write a letter. I've seen a doctor one time write a three-page letter, a specialist, outlining all the reasons why this individual cannot work. But one of the things that he said in the letter is that uh, there was uh, a day last week when he saw this individual and he actually seemed to be doing well that week. That's it. But, but that's yeah. buried within a mountain of other facts and observations uh, leading to the conclusion that this person, even though he had that one good day, could not work. Mm -hmm. And yet the insurance company... They latched onto it. They latched onto it. They yeah. cherry-picked. And it's ridiculous. So the, your doctors are on your side, but the insurance company will not necessarily take their conclusions and observations at face value. They will try to challenge those conclusions, which is why in many instances they will send you to their own assessments, to doctors that work for the insurance companies, hoping that they'll get a different opinion from their doctors. That they're paying for. Yep, that they're paying for. Number three is this, assuming that once you're approved for LTD, well, there's nothing more to be concerned about. Well, I, I can tell you, I, I, no doubt people are watching this show right now who are on LTD or who know people who are on disability who are shaking their heads knowing that the fact that you've been approved for long-term disability, while it's good news, 
there is usually trouble up ahead. At some point, the insurance company will try to shake you off claim. They'll try to tell you that you can do another job. They'll try to tell you that you have to go to this assessment and this doctor doesn't agree with your doctor. You're gonna feel stuck in the middle. You're gonna feel like you're being pressured. Again, once you're an LTD, do not let your guard down. Be careful in terms of what you're telling the adjuster. Be careful of how you're dealing with them. Confirm everything in writing via email. Yep. Be very careful. Once you're approved, that's not the end of the road. At some point, the insurance company is going to try and shake you off claim. We were talking about the top five mistakes individuals make when dealing with long-term disability insurers. Number four is this, assuming that your insurance company is always right. Well, that's what they want you to think. Well, yeah. And, and, and you know, they want you to think that they have this expertise, which, which they do. But the expertise they have in insurance, they use against you. How? They will throw some clause at you, a pre-existing condition, or they'll tell you that the two-year mark is coming up and you, know, you have to do something. You have to do a work hardening program or a transferable skills analysis assessment or something. They will make you think that everything they say is right. Absolutely not. Test everything the adjuster is telling you. Don't take anything at face value. It could be what, the, what they're telling you is correct. I have people, for example, contacting me saying, my adjuster says I have to apply for CPP disability. Well, the vast majority of policies out there, they do obligate you to yeah. apply for CPP disability. If you don't, the insurance company may estimate how much you're supposed to be getting and reduce your yeah. payments by that amount. But my point is that don't assume everything the adjuster is saying is right. Because chances are, at some point in the claims process, you are going to get the wrong information, or at least you're going to interpret what the adjuster is saying incorrectly, but it's going to be to their benefit, not yours. Top five mistakes individuals make when dealing with their LTD insurers. Number five, last one is this, assuming that you are powerless against that insurance company. That's my favorite. David and Goliath. That's it, David and Goliath. I, I say that. Yeah. David and Goliath. Everybody knows the story about David and Goliath. Who won? Mm -hmm. Who won that battle? Right. And this is what people need to understand. And I, again, I'm talking as someone who used to work many years ago for insurance companies. Yeah. You don't understand, as an individual out there battling an insurance company, how much power you actually have. You assume insurance companies are these omnipotent companies, powerful entities that have billions of dollars. Yeah, but they don't have those billions of dollars. They haven't accumulated all that wealth by fighting every claim. They've accumulated that wealth by taking in premiums and then playing the odds that when they cut you off or deny your claim, you will walk away from money that otherwise they would have to pay you. So don't assume that you are powerless. The law is on your side and it's extremely powerful. Time and time again, judges have knocked insurance companies on the head, made them pay a ton of money depending on each claim, and in some instances, Judges have gone as far, and juries, by the way, as far as awarding uh, what's called extra contractual damages, punitive damages, punishment against the insurance company. Not in every case, of course. So again, most of these cases never ever go to court because insurance companies are terrified of playing the odds in front of a judge or a jury, which is why when we start the legal claim process, they eventually come to the table and try and resolve it with us. When it comes to LTD, what does it mean to be totally disabled? We'll get to that after a short break, so stick around for it. one 821 5900 is the number to uh, reach out, and also disabilityrights.ca. Lots more of the Disability Law Show is on the way. Hang on. You were being harassed, and when you said something about it, you're the one who lost your job. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. Insurance companies deny long-term disability claims all the time. They give lots of excuses. Don't give up. I've seen it all. They've ignored your doctors. They've ignored you. You're angry and you're frustrated. But there's hope. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. Call Savannah and his team, 1-855-821-5900 or go to disabilityrights.ca. You thought you had a secure job. You didn't see it coming. Now what do you do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca.
The Disability Law Show. Welcome back. John Scholes, Savannah Tamarkin. Another re resource for you to reach out. I'll give you the first ones. 1-855-821-5900. The phone number, disabilityrights.ca or help at disabilityrights.ca through email. There's also mydisabilityquestions.com. You can go there, ask your questions. Uh, pretty, pretty good chance your question has been asked. If so, it's been answered in depth. If not, leave it there. Savannah and his team will get to it again. My Disability Questions. Dot com for that. We'll get to the first one for the show today. Savan, as follows. Uh, Cindy writes in, says, my brother's a paramedic and has PTSD. His long-term disability claim was rejected by his insurance company. They said he is not, quote-unquote, totally disabled and can still work. He has appealed once. You love all this. Is, this is great for you. Appealed once, totally disabled. He was rejected. Uh, his job's very stressful, and I'm worried that he'll get worse if he has to deal with the insurance company. What should he do? Well, you know, I mean, this is why when we get into the picture, when, when we are retained to deal with these kinds of situations, we take over all communications with the insurance company. The individual or their family who've been communicating thus far with the adjuster no longer have to deal. Point, the yeah. letters stop, the emails stop, the phone calls stop, that alone all the help. harassment stops. Yeah. That alone. People have told me. People sometimes ignore when I tell them, you are owed hundreds of thousands of dollars. They ignore that. All they hear is, I don't have to deal with no the adjuster. No more phone calls. I mean, the stress that that puts on someone, especially someone like this. A paramedic of, for God's sakes, PTSD. I mean, how difficult is it to understand that someone in that kind of a job yeah. can get PTSD? I mean, it's Thanks. insane, right? So... Again, you know, it's just completely unfair for the insurance company to be victimizing this person. Now, he went through an appeal. Again, we know that these appeals are useless. I'm not saying that they never work, but what I'm saying is I never say that nobody, you know, ever wins a lottery. Right. I mean, but this is not lottery. This is money that's owed to you. That's the difference. Why are you taking a chance? Why are you taking a chance and hoping that the good faith that the insurance company is presenting to you will translate into money that is owed to you. Insane. It's absolutely insane. So, to answer the question here, we can absolutely work, uh, sorry, we can absolutely help uh, this person. Uh, again, uh, the insurance company takes the position he's not totally disabled. PTSD, depression, anxiety, all host of mental health issues, these are debilitating conditions. And when you have treatment providers, psychotherapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, family doctors, a whole bunch of people like that who have expertise in the area saying this person cannot work. There is no reason that I can think of why insurance companies will deny that claim, save and accept for them thinking that he will simply walk away from money that is owed to him. And this is why we are here to educate people. It's why we do this show. And I'm telling you, John, and I'm telling this individual here, we can help your brother. The thing is, though, especially with a case like this, when you're talking an ambulance uh, employee, you know, PTSD, and you, say, uh, you often say these cases, the vast majority never see a courtroom, but could you imagine the, the way people feel the jury would love that someone, a first responder, be getting the screws put to them by an insurance company? There is no way. Police, there fire, ambulance. There is no ambulance. way in the world, in the world, that an insurance company is going to take a case like this to court. Yeah. So one of the things people need to understand, and you know, this is just the reality of how we deal with these kinds of claims, both when I did defense work for insurance companies and now when I help individuals who are disabled, we look not only at the facts as they're presented, we're looking at the optics, right? If you're watching a TV show, you know who the good guy is, who's the bad guy. Sometimes it's a bit more complicated, but think about this for a second. You have a paramedic suffering from PTSD, the treatment providers are saying this person cannot work, put that person with their doctors, against the insurance adjuster who is going to be a witness in court, in front of a judge. It will never happen. This will never, ever get to court. The insurance company can't afford to have this go to court. They're going to get nailed to, to the wall. So you have to understand you have that power, that power that I'm telling you that we talked about before. You have that power that the insurance company is trying to convince you you don't have. All we do is we help you exercise that power. We give you the tools. You have to give us the instructions, and then we go at them. And once we go at them, there is a reason why, again, insurance companies will come to the table to try and stem off the bleed. They will try to settle the case. Help at disabilityrights.ca is the email address you can use anytime. Here's one from Byron. says, I've heard you speak about bad faith damages before, or punitive damages, that some disabled individuals may uh, be able to claim from insurance companies who deny legitimate claims. What does it mean? Can you explain this a little bit more? Yeah, we touched on this before, and it's important for people to understand. In Canada, it's not 
that common for courts to award bad faith damages. That said, I can tell you that not a week passes by in my office where we don't look at a claim that we're handling, someone's handling in the office, that we don't think to ourselves, amongst ourselves, the lawyers, my God, if this thing ever went to court, yeah. I can see a judge or a jury awarding bad faith damages. So what are bad faith damages? Well, the two words, bad faith. Insurance companies have an obligation, a duty to treat you fairly as their claimant. It's a sacred duty. Courts have recognized that. When insurance companies not only do things that are not in your interest, but that are clearly a violation of that sacred duty that they owe you, mm -hmm. we can show that to a court if we ever get there, and a court may not only award you what you're entitled to under the policy, so not only what the insurance company ought to have paid you, right. but above and beyond that, extra money to punish the insurance company for their conduct. And insurance companies, I can tell you, John, historically have been hit sometimes with significant punitive damages awards. Insurance companies are terrified of that because it, it creates a precedent. And, and when they know they're exposed to it, oh, we have a field day with them in negotiations because they never want to negotiate that, that bad, bad faith damages. Yeah. So what we do is we tell them, we don't care what you call it. You know, you owe my client Joe $300,000. I think I can get another two hundred in punitive damages. Fine, you want to settle for 200,000 in addition to the 300 and not call it punitive damages? We can do that. Right. And they will do that. They will do that. They do not want to take a chance that a jury or a judge will award a lot more than that against them. I want to bounce back over to MyDisabilityQuestions.com. You can use that any time. A uh, friend writes in and says, I have MS and have started to experience more symptoms of my condition over the last few years. My doctor told me that I would have to go on disability leave, so we submitted medical notes and applications. I was let go from my job after this due to restructuring, and my insurance company has denied my claim as a result. Is there anything I can do? Do I still have any coverage? This is an excellent question, and we get that a lot, and it was actually recently, there was a court case about that. So here's what you need to understand and, and, and know. Uh, and this ties in well to what I said earlier, that we have employment lawyers and disability yep. lawyers working together, because she's going to be entitled to severance, okay? And even if the insurance company, if we force the insurance company to pay her LTD, uh, the, they may claim a credit for that severance. Yes. But what she's asking is, am I even covered? So here's what you need to understand. As long as you became disabled when you still had coverage with LTD, you can make an application to LTD and you should be covered. And if you're not, we can force the insurance company to pay. What happens in a situation where somebody was let go from their job and the severance they're supposed to get is for a year, a year severance as an example. Right. And they became disabled six months after they were let go from their job. Well, the argument is that for that year that they were supposed to get severance, they're also supposed to have that coverage for LTD, assuming they had that when they were employed. Okay. Which means that during that time, if you became disabled, the insurance company cannot deny your LTD claim. And if they do, we can go after them. But there is a misconception out there. People think, well, I became disabled when I was employed, but then immediately then, just before I was about to apply for LTD, I got let go. So I can't apply for LTD. They, they both yes, you at can. the same time. Yeah, yeah, you have to apply for LTD. Get, even if you get rejected, at least we get that denial letter and we can tell you what you can do about it. Right. That's, people need to understand, don't just wait, because people end up waiting and waiting and waiting, and then a year passes and two years, and then we can't help you. Right. If you became disabled while you had LTD coverage through work or after you were let go, but during the time where you were supposed to get severance, you should qualify for LTD. You should have coverage as long as you, beca as long as you became disabled during that time. Last thoughts about reaching out. What do you think? I want to tell everybody. Well, I want to tell people that, you know, it's just unfortunate that the system is, in my opinion, rigged against individuals. It's absolutely rigged because you have these powerful insurance companies, you have a powerful insurance lobby out there, and all they're doing is making money, in my opinion, off the backs of people who work extremely hard, pay premiums, think that they are, you know, that they're covered. And again, you see this not just with long-term disability, with house insurance, with car insurance. Yeah. You see this with all kinds of insurance. You have more power than you think you do. I know I have, you know, beaten that horse to death, but people need to understand you have more power than you think you do. If you've been denied or cut off long-term disability unjustly, we can help you, period.
The number is simple, 1-855-821-5900. We mentioned MyDisabilityQuestions.com. Referred to it a couple times on this show, as we always do. Email is help at disabilityrights.ca. Please send them along. We get to them on this show and the radio show as well. And if you want to find more details on our radio show, you can simply go to disabilityrights.ca as well. Great resource for you there. And we'll catch you next time right here on the Disability Law Show. Thank you for hanging out with us.